I got a phone call when I was in Las Vegas covering the, the WCC tournament for us, and, and it was Eli asking what I thought about us going to Ukraine. And I, I thought I, I thought he might be drunk. I wasn't, I wasn't sure, uh, but we talked and, 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 and we kept working through it and all of a sudden it started to make a lot of sense. So we started working with, and this is all within a matter of just a couple of days. And, and, and all, we started uh, dealing with HR, which is a lot of fun when you're wanting to send someone to cover a war. And we had to sign uh, insurance policies that we did not need at all because we had no idea what to do. Uh, I have never taken out uh, an insurance policy for kidnapping before. This was the first. And, and, and I, I'm with that photo. Could have happened. So, so, uh, so, so, so uh, all, all said and done, it, it, would I do it again in a heartbeat? Was it worth it? Absolutely. You know, it took something that was on the other side of the planet and made it incredibly human. We could feel it. These were people from here helping us tell these stories. It was just so powerful. He's going to talk a lot about that tonight. So first, uh, I want to show a, a little bit of a video about how the process happened. And uh, I want to get some little out first. <laughs> that uh, those people, who, those families who lived, uh, you can see the parts of their lives. They are there. They are lying on the ground. Spokane is home to one of the largest Ukrainian populations in the United States. In the 1980s, many Ukrainians came here, fleeing religious persecution in the Soviet Union. During the 1990s, economic instability following the Soviet Union's collapse more Ukrainians found their way to Spokane to be part of the growing community of their countrymen. The migration never truly stopped. Spokane has already begun to receive even more Ukrainian refugees just over the last month. The Ukrainians' extended community here in Spokane also reached out in big ways to help during this current war. And Spokesman Review reporter Eli Frankovich was sent to Eastern Europe to cover those stories. His trip was paid for largely by Spokesman Review readers who have donated to the Community Journalism Fund and through the newspaper's Northwest Passages event series and marked the first time in the newspaper's nearly 140-year history that it had sent one of its own reporters to write about a war as it was happening. Eli's coverage made the Spokesman Review the smallest news organization in the world to travel to the area to cover the developing war only with Eli covering it much differently than most of the other journalists there. He was covering a war halfway across the planet as a local story, because in Spokane, it was. Please welcome Eli Frankovich to the Northwest Passages stage. Like if I just showed up as just a person, that's then you're a rubbernecker. But as a journalist, that's your 
job. And this, this is just a very selfish sort of personal reason, but I really, that, I really like that, and that's what has kept me going. So, I, I wanted to point out, you said that your journalism professor is in the crowd tonight. Yeah. I thought we should yeah. have yeah. him stand. That was, that was fun. Yeah.
So we got to Ukraine, or we got to Lviv, like nine or ten in the evening, and met with his contact at the military hospital, and got put, kind of like brought brought all the supplies he uh, he got donated from Providence and elsewhere, uh, donated you know dropped those off, and then they put us up in this uh, hospital room and we spent the night there. They told us to be ready by 10 a.m. and we were kind of gonna get going. Uh, 10 a.m. came and went, and we sat around for you know five or six more hours. Couldn't leave the hospital because there was some military guards. Um, I did leave at one point, got coffee, and then it was very hard to get back in. And uh, eventually, like in that that evening, our contact came and said, uh, "Yeah, we, we don't really need you anymore," which was obviously kind of a shock for Barner because he had this invitation letter. And at the time, I didn't. I put this all together later and wrote a story about it, but. When, like when the war started, there was so much public interest from all over the world, particularly the Western kind of world democracy, democracies, and there was this outpouring of, uh, you know, offering to help basically. And Ukraine, a pretty like savvy PR move, did said yes, come, everyone come. And then they got a lot of volunteers, and they started to be like, okay, maybe we don't need all these people. And, and we saw that happen uh, with medical volunteers, with military volunteers. Um, all sorts of people basically having to you know, change what they're doing. So. How do you deal with the language situation with, with most most people speaking English? It really, I mean, it really breaks down on the socioeconomic lines. So uh, the refugees I interviewed, for the most part, were poorer um, because when I was there, the wave of refugees was kind of that. Yeah, the, the really rich people had gotten out before that. Um, so we were doing, uh, I was talking to people with my phone, translation app, uh, Google Live Translate, which is pretty good. Um, and then in a few occasions I had a translator, uh, it just sort of ended. So. Where we are next. Okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, so after we, so we, we, we left the military hospital and went back to Poland, um, and at that time, so we were in Lviv, we spent one night in Lviv, uh, which is a beautiful city, and this was another thing that really struck me. I had never been around a war zone, and I was quite far from the front lines, but it was still, there was like, the stress was, you know, in the air. There was military checkpoints, um, the air raid sirens, and, all, and the whole thing. And then at the same time, there was like, you know, cafes, like a, a, I went to a cat cafe, and walked around the park. And so it was like a weird juxtaposition of normal life and then this, at like this stress and this, this tension of war, and it was, it was, I had never experienced anything quite like that. And talking to people who, refugees and others that were from like harder hit areas, more on the front lines, that, that's like a reality of this that I think we don't understand. We see the video and read the stories, and the, I mean, there's like tons of devastation, but life is also going on, right? And I think that's a hard thing to wrap your mind around, but um, people are continuing to live their lives even amidst this like, Terrible trouble then. But you would you describe the air raid sign and what the situation was when you come back and not Yeah, it? so we um so the second or I guess it was the second or third night I was in Lviv, we stayed in this hotel which was difficult to uh, get a room even, um, but, but managed to find one and um, went to bed, you know, woke up, it was the, the three of us in one room, I was on the floor, um, and at like 2 a.m. I think, these air raid sirens went off uh, and woke up, you know, very loud, kind of shaking the room. And we all kind of stumbled out of bed and stumbled into the hallways. We sort of prepped our boots and some basic stuff because we had to run down to the bomb shelter. We get into the hallway and no, no one else was getting up. <laughs> they just like, they don't even care. And so we kind of like go back to bed. And, uh, and, and that was that, yeah. yeah. Well, how did, what was the process of crossing that border both ways. Yeah, so getting into Ukraine was uh, very easy. Um, I think part, there was two things happening there. One, having a U.S. passport, uh, and I think they were welcoming journalists, and still are as far as I know. Um, and I was with a doctor who had sort of official documentation from this hospital. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't remember how long it took us, but basically we were in line with other aid workers. So there was uh, ambulances and supply trucks and, and whatnot. Um, and then getting back into Poland took a bit longer because of all the refugees going into Poland. So long lines of cars, um, as you can see up there. 
Uh, and we, we were in a vehicle, so there's also hundreds of people, thousands of people on foot waiting to process in too. And because, again, because we were in a car and had um, US passports, it went faster. From Lviv to the Polish border normally, I was told it takes about an hour drive. It took us, I think, five or six to get from Lviv to the border and then into Poland. Um, yeah, and so, but but in terms of like like passport checks and stuff, it was, it was very like wide open uh, that way. Okay. So the Varner story kind of got on hold. Yep. What was your next? So yeah, then uh, got back to Warsaw, kind of split ways from Varner for a little bit. Um, most, so the majority of the stories I did on this trip were local, right, had a local tie-in, but there were a few that didn't. This one uh, was about Ukrainian refugees who were at the Ukrainian embassy in Warsaw trying to get uh, passport documentation. So Poland was letting them enter, right, with no questions asked, but then to go anywhere else became more difficult if you didn't have documentation. And a lot of these uh, women, it was almost all women and children because men 16 to 60 can't leave the country. Um, a lot of them were from small rural areas and didn't have uh, basically any sort of like official documentation, much less a passport. So they're trying to get in with the embassy at, at the same time that the embassy is dealing with you know, all the, the war repercussions. Um, so that was one story I worked on. And then I think around that time we started to hear about Matt Shea, which right. was definitely interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, but, you know, that, why don't we describe what happens yeah. in the upcoming? What the, we had, we, we heard, you started hearing that Matt Shea had helped take children from the uh, Maripol, from the orphanage. Yeah, as I, so as I was flying to Poland, uh, one of my colleagues, Emma, texted me a photo from Facebook, basically, of Matt Shea saying he rescued these kids from Mariupol. And so I um, texted him uh, once I landed and asked, I'd said I'd love to chat with you, didn't hear back. Uh, and then we started to see like Polish media reporting that there was concerns about what was happening to these kids because the Polish volunteers hadn't been allowed in to the hotel that they were staying at. Um, and that sort of, so we began, yeah, we began reporting that. And um, basically what happened is he had helped get these kids from Mariupol, which was one of the worst besieged cities, um, to a small town in Poland. And it was through one of his church connections. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, there's no doubt that it's better that those kids were not in Mariupol. I don't think anyone can really rationally argue that. Um, but then the question was, like, okay, what happens next to these children? And if you know anything about like, when the USSR fell, there was huge abuses, orphan abuses, as these nation states were disintegrating. And so that was sort of like, the specter of that was definitely there. Um, it's sort of the upshot of this all was that there was a lot of media attention from the spokesmen, the Seattle Times, and larger uh, publications in the US. And the Polish and Ukrainian governments said, these kids aren't going anywhere until the war is over and we can kind of do this properly. Um, which I think is probably a good thing, but there is a consequence. So I interviewed a woman in New York, upstate New York, who was mid-process adopting one of these kids. He had visited her and her family. He had won the orphan lottery, essentially. And now it's all on hold and maybe not happening. And so that's, I mean, that's hard. That's a hard thing. But uh, that's, that's where it's at. Um, and so Matt Shea left. I think he's back, back around here now. Um, and the kids are still there. It's last letter. So. You had contact with a counselor from Post Falls. Yeah, so Jared Malone was, uh, or is, a counselor. Uh, he lives in Post Falls. He was a Marine uh, veteran. Uh, he was a tank crewman, served in Iraq. And while in Iraq, he got in a firefight uh, with some insurgents, and some kids were killed. You know, they killed some kids, some Iraqi kids, and uh, unintentionally, of course. And it obviously really messed him up. He had severe PTSD. And, uh, that sort of led him to get counseling in the VA when he, when he uh, came out of the service. And that then led to him getting a counseling degree. And he uh, is also a Christian, so when the war started, he wanted to help like a lot of people. And he reached out to this church in Lviv and said, hey, can I come over and help? And they said no, because they, they understood what was happening with a lot of volunteers. But he explained his, you know, his background, being a combat veteran and having 
uh, you know, counseling and a, a degree in training. And they eventually said yes, actually, you come over. And so he um, he came over. I don't remember what date, mid March, I think, um, and was in Poland for a little bit, and then went to Lviv and spent most of the time there. He went to Kiev as, as well, and um, helped get families out of there. And he was raising money the whole time. And then at the very sort of end of his trip, uh, his first trip, he's actually been back once since then. He was planning another trip in a few months. He um, gave a talk to you know, first responders and, and volunteers in Lviv about how they could help themselves or take care of themselves uh, emotionally kind of amongst all this trauma. It seems to me that that um, gentleman, uh, of all the folks, he talked to people who went over to fight, and, um, you know, that's so forth. But I, it seems to me he's the one who really got the most out of it, who really felt like he made a difference in, in my right. I think, no, I think you're right. Um, he had the, he kind of had the most, he probably had the best resume for doing this kind of stuff, just being a combat veteran. He really knew how to be in that kind of situation. And you can, you can kind of, I met a lot of like people from all over that were going to like fight or help. And a lot, most of them, in my opinion, was like, what are you doing here? Like, you're not gonna, it's not gonna be useful. But he just had, you could tell he like take care of himself. He wasn't gonna be a burden on anyone. Um, he was just kind of dialed in himself. Plus, I think his own, his backstory of just that happening, it's happening in Iraq, it gave him this kind of like, it was, a, it was a real full circle kind of moment for him, and that's that's what he told me. Well, that's not my interpretation. So uh, you, we found out about a, a vet, a veterinarian. Yeah. Um, when you talk about that. Story. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, so back a little bit up. So um, Kyle Warner, the doctor from Spokane, he was kind of as this was going on, and I was working on these stories, Mache and Jerry Bone. Varner um, was talking to different contexts. And so Varner's background, he worked in Venezuela doing this kind of work with refugees in the Venezuelan border. And so he had some, he had some experience around this kind of stuff. Um, so, and he had a lot of contacts. Uh, and, and so he got in with this like Doctors Without Borders group type group that was not Doctors Without Borders, but a similar one. And we uh, went to the Polish border, this town called Medica, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it and spent a week there working a night shift. So he would start at midnight and work until 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. And this was the biggest refugee intake point um, on the Polish border. Not, and while we were there, it slowed down a little bit, but the slow was like, maybe like 15,000 a day, right? 20,000, so that's, I don't know, that's not slow by my definition. But, um, so, so this, it was amazing. It was like, you'd walk, you'd cross from the Ukrainian border into Poland, and there was like a, a really grimy sort of festival at like a carnival or something. There was, the first tent was a medical tent where Varner was, and that was any kind of ailments. And so we saw uh, like stomach aches, colds, uh, a lot of anxiety, so we would prescribe anxiety medication. Pretty minor stuff. Um, I heard a story about one bullet wound, but it was not like war. And these are people that have been traveling for like three days and were sick and scared, basically. So, that's the first tent. And then you have like coffee and soup and food and cat carriers and cat food and dog leashes and just anything you could imagine was there. Uh, it, it was really pretty amazing to see that. And so Barner, reflecting on the difference between Venezuela and, and this border, um, he was really struck by that. He called it an A plus, like an A plus refugee crisis response. So we spent a week there um, working with refugees and met uh, a lot of different people, but one family that really stood out to me um, was Monsef. He's one of the few men that I interviewed. He was a, a Egyptian national. He's been living um, in near Mariupol with his Ukrainian wife and their son. And they had spent two or three days getting out of Ukraine. They had to pass through like 60 Russian checkpoints and going crazy like this. And when they arrived, um, his son, Kareem, uh, he was like seven years old. He was like just shut, like shut down, like just pulled into himself. It was like two in the morning. Wouldn't make eye contact. It was very like, sort of like, just sad to see. And then over the course of like a couple hours, um, he really just opened up and sort of like became a little kid again. And was at the end like playing and laughing. And so that was, I thought that was really hopeful to see that, uh, especially in the midst of this kind of just like, 
dirge and like you know, awful, awful stories. Um, it was uh, that was nice for me to see just personally. So. What do you think Werner's final take on what he did over there was? Yeah, I think he. Uh, so he did a few things. He he raised money, which was good, um, and he did help at the border there. I mean, it wasn't like fast pace or something, but they needed staffing, so he did that. Um, yeah, and then I think, I mean, he did, he dropped off supplies in the Aviv, so that's good. I don't know if that would have warranted the whole trip, but uh, he, he managed to put it all together. Um, I think he, what he told me a few times was that he was expecting sort of this, like, Venezuelan type refugee response where there's been people that are, like, walking for the week, and they basically, no one's there to help them. And that's not what was happening. And that really, I mean, that just personally, that got me thinking about how we decide who is like a worthy victim and who isn't a worthy victim. And so at Medica, this Polish border crossing, a, you know, where all this like amazing support was being given, roughly a year ago, in that same area, Afghani and Syrian refugees were trying to get into Poland, and they were beat, beaten back, you know, and like pushed into Belarus, and just totally, they were trying to get asylum. And, and that's, I mean, that's a very unequal, unequal response. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I think racism is probably one, but there's also political, uh, you know, like Russia is this sort of traditional enemy of, of, of Western Europe, right? Um, but it, it really got me thinking, and, and it's, it's something that I've struggled with, right? Like even this reporting trip, would I have thought to pitch this story, this trip, you know, for something like that? I don't know. I, I hope I would have, I don't know. So, yeah, that was, that was something to chew on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you end up in Romania. Yeah, so uh, Varner finished out his week um, working there, and then he, he kind of was done. He hadn't been there three or four weeks at that point. Um, and I sort of like how I pitched it originally, I kept calling and saying, well, do you want me to come home? And so we kept finding stories, so I kept saying. And um, the, 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 I was told about a veterinarian from Bonners Ferry um, who was kind of a famous veterinarian as far as veterinarians go. He'd been on Good Morning America for 17 years. Actually wrote with a spokesman back in the day. Uh, his written books, Marty Becker. Um, he was flying over. We heard about him on Twitter or something because he's got his famous, like I said. And I called him up uh, one night in Warsaw. He was driving to Spokane to just meet up with his daughter or something asked if I could join him in Romania and he said yes, which is back to why I love journalism. Like what kind of crazy question and he's never even heard of me and you know two days later I'm flying from Vienna. Um, so I landed in Bucharest to meet up with him and we went to the border, the Ukrainian uh, Romanian border. And he was so he's a veterinarian, but his the thing he was bringing to all this was like being able to raise money and attention. And so we, we went to this first we went to like a, a shelter, an animal shelter in Galatia. Uh, which is a small little blue collar town, steel plant type place, and met with uh, Alex Seva, who was 22, 10 years ago she started this rescue for animals. Uh, they have 300 dogs and an unknown number of cats living there, and many of them, I think about 100 of them at that point, were from Ukraine. Um, and that's another thing to think about with this war is like family, you know, people are leaving and they're bringing their pets. And so we, we met with her and toured that place. In, uh, uh, Becker was very impressed with how clean it was, and there was no like fighting between the animals. Um, and then we went to the border, where there was a you know veterinarian presence, just like the the medical like human doctors. There was also veterinarians, and we spent a couple hours there as well, and met this family, uh, a mom and her two kids, who had been traveling for two days, forgetting exactly where they were coming from. But they came. They were with their Doberman and a hamster and a cat. <laughs> And uh, so I'm, we're talking, and we, we have like incredible access because Marty Becker is good at getting, like, just making people like him. So we're like, he's like chatting up the, the head of security, and I'm just talking to people, and it was great. And we're, I'm walking with this family and trying to interview him, and this Doberman like busts free and starts running, and I, I thought he escaped. I was like, oh gosh, this isn't going to be good. And so I'm kind of like backpedaling to try to stay in front of him and take the photos. And it turns out the dog had seen his, his dad, his dog dad, who had been living in Poland, like jumped into his arms. And it was just a really, it was a really sweet moment. 
and that was, I was kind of skeptical, because this wasn't my story idea, I don't think, and I was a little skeptical, like, like, why do we care about a veterinarian, right? Like, with all this, like, human suffering. And I asked Marty that, and his, you know, he had a good answer, I thought. He basically said, oh, these people have lost or are losing everything, right? Their sons and their husbands are back in the train, their homes are, they're gone from their homes. And this, like, a pet is a point of consistency, a point of contact, and, um, they, you know, if you help a pet, you're going to help the people, is kind of his tagline. He's good at tagline. Um, <laughs> and then I, you saw that, I saw that with, with, with his family. I thought it was really the illustrative point. Um, you closed out with a big story on two, uh, two men from Spokane who went there to fight. Um, and you've been in touch with at least one of them pretty much the whole time you've been there. And, Talk about this kind of relationship you formed, and, and most interestingly, how you yeah, came upon him. This was crazy. Yeah. Um, so, I think as Rob mentioned, there was this all kind of the trip came together like within a couple of days, but there was a point where I was kind of on standby, standby because we were waiting for the insurance stuff to clear, and so I was told, okay, you're going to leave tonight, or not tonight, the next day, and then it changed back and forth. Finally, I had tickets to leave like Wednesday morning. And so I uh, went out to get a beer with a couple of friends before I left. And I'm at the bar ordering a beer. And I hear this guy, like, hey, yeah, my buddy just landed in uh, Poland. He's going into the Ukraine fight. He's from Spokane. And I was like, whoa. So I went over and talked to him. And um, it was this guy who lives in, in Brown's edition. He's an Air Force veteran. Um, and he headed over to get some Special Forces contacts, U.S. Special Forces. He was not a Special Forces guy, but he had the contacts there, and they came up with the Ukrainian team. And so he um, spent two months, at, or yeah, about two months in Kiev, Kiev sorry, um, training, basically training like all types of people. So he trained the Ukrainian uh, um, uh, like uh, chief justices, basically, on how to like do basic like military stuff, and was do, doing all this kind of like weapons training and, and all this. And then went out on, on like a sort of after action view with some Ukrainian units. Um, so yeah, he was there. And then for the basically yeah, two, the whole time, um, and I kept in touch with him. I couldn't go into Ukraine at this point because of some of the, the HR stuff, but uh, I kept in touch with him, just calling him every day or almost every day, kind of hearing about his, his experience there. And then we met up in um, in Krakow, which went back to Poland. Uh, and then at the same time, there was another guy um, from. Odessa, I think, Washington, so a little farther afield, uh, who also went over and volunteered. And he, he didn't have sort of the military background. He was a corrections officer, uh, and, and so not quite as dialed in as, as um, Chris was. But he, he, did, he ended up joining the Foreign Legion, like officially through the Ukrainian government, and uh, did end up kind of being in combat. He got shelled, and I agreed him about that. It was a, it was a very dramatic. Uh, and, and again, uh, it's back to that volunteer piece. So the Ukrainian Foreign Legion, when the war started, they accepted anyone, basically. You show up, they would give you some basic training um, and get you in a unit with other foreign fighters. Uh, and then they kind of dialed, or they dialed up their requirements. So when I, was, when I was doing this story, they had just changed it. So you had to have combat experience. And neither of these guys did. Uh, but I think Chris, because he was able to be pretty effective, I think, in some of the training, um, sort of in a support role. The communication was, to me, surprising how good it was, especially as Kiev, Kiev was under attack. Like, how reliable was it that if you call him in Kiev, you pick up? Yeah. And, I mean, it was like calling my mother. <laughs> like, it was not a problem. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, I mean, that's again, like, we think, you, you hear about Ukraine and the war, and you think it's all shut down, but there were nightly trains to Kiev throughout the time I was there. Uh, I could have gotten on a train and been there, and it probably would have been fine. Chris, uh, I would talk to him, and I would be hearing these reports of Russians getting closer. I mean, partly he kind of has this, like, macho nonchalance thing going on, but, um, so he basically wasn't worried. He's like, yeah, I don't know. Go out on walks and stuff. And so it's, 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 it's you know, we think of like 
Ukraine is small, but it's a very large country, and so all of this is happening, you know, over geographic space uh, that, that spreads it out a bit. So, uh, and he did end up in Bucha, correct? Uh, yes, he did. Uh, he did go through Bucha. Um, I think he was there. He was there a couple days after the Russians had pulled back, and people were starting to see sort of the extent of the atrocities there. Um, and he was on. A, he was documenting like destroying Russian vehicles, so he was not involved with that. But he said that um, on the radio they would hear, "Oh, found another one," and then that was like every couple minutes. And at first they didn't know what it was referencing, but it was dead civilians. What was he sent them for? To uh, document, like, Just to document, the yeah. So he was with um, some Ukrainians, a Ukrainian unit, and their mission on that trip was to, uh, yeah, to see kind of what happened after the after the, the front lines had changed. So. Do you think you met with both of them in Poland after they were done? Did they regret going? Did they? Uh, Chris did not. Yeah. Um, no, he, he felt like he was pretty useful. He left uh, when he did because he had some he had school coming up, actually. He's in a nursing program, I believe. Um, but he told me that if he got a contract and was paid, he would go back and just like serve a, serve a term. Did he not he didn't get paid while he was there? Was all he did not get paid, yeah. Um, I'm blanking the Odessa guy's name, which is awful, but uh, the, the, the Odessa guy who was Part of the Foreign Legion, he um, he was supposed to get paid through the Foreign Legion, but but was not. Uh, at last I heard, he had not received any of that money, and he was a lot more. Uh, he basically was like, yeah, I'm not sure it was so useful for me to go, um, and and was pretty pretty critical of how the Ukrainian government was on board, you know, like using volunteers. Um, so yeah, that he had a definitely a rougher experience that way. And you, you, you were there two, two months or so. What are your kind of main takeaways from your reporting? Your yeah, background? yeah, I think, so then I, I've been thinking a lot about this because it's a question that comes up a lot. Um, I think, so there's two really. The first is that we as Americans, and I'm using that obviously, we all have different backgrounds, but broadly as a culture, we do not know what war is like. Because we have not had a war on our soil, you know, forever, essentially. And I think you can, I mean, you can't, you just can't know it. I was 400 miles, 300 miles, and I felt it. I began to feel it. But it's still, it's not like to have your city bombed or to have to see, you know, yeah, to see that, to live through that, that changes, changes you. And I think it changes how people make political decisions. And I think that's a huge takeaway for me is that I, I think we need to remember that we don't know. And we can't know, right? And hopefully we don't ever know, but we have to remember we don't know what war is actually like. Um, and you, even in Poland, right, there was this, this is cultural memory that's very close to the surface of like what, what it means to be in an all-out war. Um, and there was a lot of stress about that, a lot of tension there. So I think that's a huge takeaway for me. I think the other thing is that the, like the emotion, the response that the care and the humanitarian response for this for Ukrainian refugees is beautiful, right? It's like amazing. But I would I caution myself to not let that sort of good humanistic response be turned be politicized basically and turned into uh, without you have know, politicizes and just to not only focus on like like Ukrainian refugees to try to broaden that and not just be focused on that. And there's obviously there's you know, like if you think about the southern border immigration and the southern border in the U.S., there's uh, a, a very reasonable debate about immigration. I think that that has to be done, but to just forget the human suffering of these people that have traveled, I think is, we can't do that. We have to remember that uh, there's there's real suffering going on, and it's it's not just limited to Ukraine. And that's not to take anything away from Ukrainian refugees. I could, I mean, I spent you know a lot of time talking to these women and children. It's awful. It's a lot of suffering to try to expand our consciousness a little bit around that. I think it's valuable. All right. Well, should we go to the Q and A? Q and A. All right. Mr. Schlesen, it's interesting. Will you take Jonathan's mic here? Or can you put that up?
Thank you very much, Jonathan. I really appreciate you leading this conversation with Eli and Christine. We have questions from the audience. We'll start over. Oh, we can start way in the back. Hold on. Thank you very much for going and doing this and making a fantastic um, opportunity for us to read. But can you tell us a little bit about how you handled the language barriers and how did that influence what stories you could tell and how you could tell them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, 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 sort of baseline: Ukrainian and Polish. The Ukrainian and Polish languages they can kind of understand each other, but it's it's not one for one, right? Yeah, and. So I was using uh, the iPhone application, like a, a Google Translate Live Translate for a lot of stuff, which was not ideal because it, you can't kind of get into the, just a conversation, which is where I think the best interviews come from. Um, but I was lucky enough, I met this uh, Polish volunteer pretty early on in my stay, and she, so big newspapers will have fixers for their reporters, right? And these are people who set up interviews, get translators, help with transportation. She kind of became my like unofficial fixer. She would text me like three times a day with story ideas, most of them I couldn't do. But she was very on it, right? And so she, for a few of the stories I did, she actually found a translator for me, which was incredibly helpful. Um, and, and yeah, I owe her a lot. So. Christine, how did you, oh pardon me, Christine, how did you uh, become a publisher for Ukrainian poets, you represent, or you know, some of your books are the rock star, you said even one of the rock stars of Ukrainian poetry. How it, find them? Yes, how do you find them? Oh, well, I was fortunate enough to have a friend who's a, a Polish poet here uh, in California getting his PhD. And he, he and a poet from Port Townsend, Stan Rubin, asked me if I knew this woman named uh, Grace Mahoney, who was getting her PhD at the University of Michigan. And I said, no, I don't know her. So they introduced me to her, and she was translating the poems of Irina Starovoit, who lives and teaches in Lviv. And she said to me, well, might you be interested in publishing my translation of Irina's work? And that was it. That was that question um, coalesced everything that I had been working toward as a publisher. I'm, I'm Ukrainian, my parents were refugees after World War II, and this was something that, at that, right at that moment when she asked me if I would publish her translations, I thought, oh, we have to go, we have to do more than that. And I said to her, well, do you, I'll publish this, but do you, uh, have contacts with other other poets because she had been going back and forth to Ukraine. She was doing her research for her PhD, and indeed she was having contact with a lot of poets, and she was going to poetry readings. So she she's the acquisitions editor. She's the series editor for the Ukrainian series, and she's back and forth from Ukraine or had been, and so she would co connect with poets and say, there's a press in America that, that would like to publish your work in translation. And we would have to find a translator for those po poets who did not have a translator, uh, because there, there was very little uh, poetry being published in English or being translated. So it was with, Grace is now part of Lost Horse Press. She's the series editor. and. Without her, I would not have made, been able to make contact. So we, we make a great team, because I'm here and making the books, and she's out in the field you know, getting people, getting these poets for us. Which who was the poet that was fed uh, on the brands? Because I found out about you from the Grammys, actually. It, suddenly, there's John Legend playing, and then there's a Ukrainian poet. And that's and, whose poem I read. Yeah. That's whose poem I read uh, when, I, when I came to the point. Um, can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. One, one, we're having 
Luba, uh, Luba Yakimchuk, and her book is called uh, uh, Apricots of Donbass, which is available outside. More questions? Right over this way. Okay, so the war is shifting. Is there a plan for you to go back? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know. Um, Rob, are we sending Eli anywhere else? We're broke. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me right there. With all of the Ukrainian camp, they learn the English. They come here, they don't know English. Uh, who teaches them? Is there people that teach English to the Ukrainians? Other people that teach English to the Ukrainians. I know that the um, uh, District 81's got a great refugee uh, uh, program that they uh, teach yeah, in there. Yeah, ESL. Kinuki College also teaches in part of the refugees that are here. Other? That, I mean, that one. Can you hear Eli? I think World Relief has class. Yeah, World yeah. Relief, yeah. We hear a lot about the, uh, the money and the weapons and everything we provide. Do you have any contact with the receiving end of that and how it was happening? Not, not directly the receiving end. I, I don't know that it is. So not, not directly. <laughs> not directly with the receiving end. Um, I did talk to some Americans who were sort of, well, I didn't do a story on it because it was all shadowy, but they were saying that they were helping get arms into Ukraine, so, yeah. Right here. Uh, um, Eli. Day, um, things that are happening. People pay to get food. People get paid to do certain work. Is that the reality you saw in these uh, in the Ukraine, or is it, you know, I, you know, what we take for granted here? What about there? Do Do you mean like before the war or during the war? Or? During the war, and what about your fixer? Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, this is again back to the, the huge influx of aid, right? There was not, people are, as far as I've heard, there's not like, anyone that's not in the front lines, they're not starving, there's food, there's a lot of sort of material support. Um, I think one thing that I didn't know before I went, and I learned from some of the Polish people I talked to, is that Ukraine is significantly poorer as a country than Poland. So, this helps. <laughs> so, um, there, there's that dynamic as well. There's a, you know, Poland has a lot more money than Ukraine. Um, and then the fixer. Uh, yeah, so Joanna Fix, actually it was her last name, so that's <laughs> um, I just put that together. But she, uh, she's a, a Polish lady. She was very active in the volunteer, volunteering and helping with um, refugees. I don't know that she seemed like she was very wealthy. She had a home in Greece, so I think she had some material support to do this. Uh, and yeah, so she was like a tremendous help. She she was um, just really well connected in, in Poland with volunteers. So. All Uh, 
Mo yeah, mostly not. Um, the, like again, back to the like what I was talking about, how it was this weird mix of feeling very normal and, and uh, especially where I was in the western side of Ukraine. Um, mostly not. The, few, the two times that it was, I felt a little more stressed about it was. Um, well, I guess it was one time. It was one of those nights in the weave. There was sort of these social media rumors, which is a huge part of this war, social media, and that's like a huge way of people are getting information. And there was this rumor coming up that Russia was going to invade from um, Belarus, which would have basically brought the war right to where we were and cut off our like retreat line to Poland. Uh, and so that was like, that was, that was the most stressful, the, sort of the scariest point for me. Um, and, and for the doctor as well, and, and he actually made the decision to go back to Poland because of that. It didn't happen, it was just a rumor, but um, there was sort of this night of kind of, and at the same time, the air raid signs were going on, so the whole mood was, it just added. But mostly not. Okay, last question. Yeah, I thank you very much for sharing several people from Spokane, and I have a tour scheduled for September, actually September 10th through the 18th. Knowing what you know, would you, just the average person, would you be game to go? Would I be game to go? Yes. Uh, I would, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. I have, I really have mixed reviews. In fact, there are some people here this evening who are signed up to go to Poland, and I think um, just being here, um, and, and just sharing with the Polish people how they've opened their hearts, their arms, their homes. It's, it's just remarkable. And I was really struck by the polls before I went, before the, the actual war took place. And now I, I can only imagine um, what it's like. And, I, I, and tourism is so important to that country. And I think that as Americans or other travelers, I think it's so important to support them. But certainly we want to be safe. Yeah. yeah. I think it's okay. So see what happens over the summer as well. Well, actually, yes, yes, it's been my minute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eli and Christine. Thank you for coming to Northwest Pass this evening.